Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I wish to thank God for this blessed morning. And thank you, Mr. Speaker, as well for what's on the menu this morning, this wonderful spinach smoothie that has had some good feeling to my soul and my well-being this morning. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the bill as presented by the Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Economic Development, Youth Economic Justice and National Security, the Appropriation Bill 2024-2025. Mr. Speaker, allow me to just one second, a few seconds to, to um, send my condolences to a cousin of mine, Rosella George and her children, well, her children who Rosella George passed in the last sitting of parliament, I did ask for her, her well-being and hoping that should have gotten well, but I'm here today in this parliament and another parliament where I now need to plan for celebrating her life on Sunday, as well as to send condolences to the family and friends of Brother Morris from Wavin Kwaso. Sadly, I will not be able to attend his funeral on the same day because I will be at the Marana for SDA Church with my family and to speak at this important celebration of Rosella George. Mr. Speaker, on the more substantive contribution this morning, I am indeed delighted to be the opening batsman or the lead sprinter for 2024-2025 budget debate as it allows me to appeal to fellow St. Lucians directly and ask that they become the biggest and best advocates for themselves. Mr. Speaker, as the minister responsible for the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment, I stand before you and my colleagues in this August House with utmost dignity, humility and zeal to highlight my ministry's activities as contained in the Appropriations Bill 2024-2025, centered around our commitment to fostering a caring, productive, and responsible society. I am reminded of this great responsibility handed to us as we begin this critical conversation to make sure that every dollar allotted to us is used efficiently and fairly to improve the lives of all citizens, especially those who are marginalized or disadvantaged. This budget demonstrates our steadfast commitment to meeting citizen needs, fostering economic expansion, and guaranteeing prudent resource management. The budget address and subsequent contribution and debates are not just matters for the wealthy and well-off. They are crucial for every single one of us, particularly, particularly the most vulnerable chance to understand the direction our country is taking in vital areas such as social protection, healthcare, education and housing, sports development. You must listen intently and learn for yourself how these policies and programs will directly impact your lives. It is through this knowledge that you can access the numerous benefits and opportunities that the government offers. This opportunity Opportunities range from new social interventions, assistance program in the Ministry of, Equ of Equity, to scholarships for education, support programs in healthcare, housing assistance, sporting initiatives, micro-enterprise support. Mr. Speaker, there are many, many, many goodies in the presentation of this budget this year. There are some people, Mr. Speaker, who would not want you to listen or would not want ordinary solutions to pay attention to the budget presentations. That is because they don't want St. Lucians to do well. Mr. Speaker, I am familiar with this selfish attitude. Many years ago at school, there were some students when I was at school in Jamaica on weekends when you ask them, are we doing work for this weekend? They tell you no. They say to you, I didn't come here to kill myself. I am not going to get mad over books, but when they get into their rooms, they are the ones 
studying harder than anybody else and will ace the exam and they would make you believe that they're not studying. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in this business of budget estimate, there are persons who would not want you to listen to the budget estimate. They would not want you to believe that there is something good. But in the silence of night, in the dark corridors, they make a case for themselves and ordinary St. Lucians stay, be stay behind. And I'm asking St. Lucians to pay attention to the business of this country. $1.8 billion is your business, and I suspect it's the largest business for this year in the Eastern Caribbean. These people, Mr. Speaker, will tarnish the reputation of the government to you. They will tarnish the reputation of St. Lucia to investors and other international concerns. Example, the Prime Minister was correct when he chose not to sign the CIP Memorandum of, of Agreement. Instead, he consistently put the good reputation of St. Lucia above everything else, including the welfare of St. Lucians. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to share critical information on vital human social service agencies under, my, under the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment. These agencies, Mr. Speaker, include the Boys Training Center, New Beginning Transit Home, the Division of Human and Social, service, human and social Services and Family Affairs. I, I shall also highlight the achievements and plans for the other social agencies under my purview to include the St. Lucia Social Development Fund, Upton Girls Center, and the James Belgrave Fund. The Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, and Empowerment embraces a philosophy of fairness, empowerment, and inclusion despite color, race, religious affiliation, or, so, or sexual orientation. This philosophy is demonstrated in our mission which seeks to promote, support, and facilitate the participation, development, and organization of our people in utilizing their resources to effect self-directed change towards the economic, social, cultural, political, and spiritual advancement for themselves, their family, their communities, and by extension, St. Lucia. While we closely examine the delivery of services by fostering a society of caring responsibility and productivity, and productivity, we are mindful that these core values aligned with our mandate of inclusivity and fairness. The ministry carries its mandates through the following. Advocacy and awareness, collaboration, partnership, and capacity building, legal framework, and program implementation. Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, and Empowerment continues to raise awareness on child maltreatment, community development and empowerment, youth vulnerabilities and disabilities through work, workshops, sensitization exercises and campaigns. The ministry's collaborative links continue at micro, meso and macro levels. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we collaborate with NGOs, civil society groups and international organizations. Through continuous community development and family support efforts, the Ministry of Equity offers the necessary support to both clients and staff in areas of capacity building initiatives and partnership and collaboration. These activities are done locally, regionally, and internationally. Regarding a legal framework, the Ministry ensures that the relevant legislation is placed to uphold and guide the administration on social justice and safeguard the rights of individuals families and communities deemed vulnerable and marginalized. There is a deliberate action to prevent and reduce stigma discrimination and unfair treatment, especially among vulnerable people. Mr. Speaker, these are examples of a few NGO acts. The status of, a, of, child, of the children of the child's bill or the children's bill. The United Nations Convention Rights of Children and the Domestic Violence Bill. Mr. Speaker, let me remind this House that the budget for the Ministry of Equity, yes, was reduced by $17,545,400 because a project had come to completion. But Mr. Speaker, as well as the National Conservation Authority was replaced in the Ministry of, Ministry of Tourism, rightfully so. But Mr. Speaker, when we speak of the investment in social safety nets, 
why this was reduced the prime minister increased the allocation for pensioners which is part of the mandate of the ministry of equity the prime minister provided support for each private early childhood center so when the prime minister minister reduced or the a project has has come to an end and has reduced the amount from 70 million to 50 something million on the other hand, the Prime Minister has invested significantly in the same mandate of Ministry of Equity by increasing the allocation to pensioners, moving it from $300, those who get $300, to, five, to $700, as well as $500. So the investment in the social sector in this budget is significant and continues to grow. Mr. Speaker, I remain committed to sharing with you, based on the guided theme, fostering a caring, responsible, and productive society. I bring to your attention the individuals behind these figures as we examine the challenges of making allocation as equitable as possible. The, the individuals behind these allocated figures are the marginalized communities, vulnerable children, and the people who are coping with poverty, violence, or discrimination. Mr. Speaker, I can attest that every parliamentarian in this chamber know these individuals who are struggling because they come to us. And if you happen to visit their home, Mr. Speaker, or visit them when they're in their locality, you would know them even better. This budget presentation speaks to a deliberate effort to invest in social mobility, address systematic, systemic injustices, and create avenues for empowerment for historically excluded or disregarded, which should be our top priority. I implore our citizens, therefore, to engage in this budget discussion with practicality, empathy, and compassion. In so doing, we shall be mindful to use best practices, stakeholders' involvement, evidence-based practice, and solutions to inform our decisions and guide our policies. Let me share with you some of our achievements guided by the theme of a society of caring productivity and responsibility, a caring society. We prioritize developing a society that pays keen attention to the most vulnerable, most vulnerable among us. In so doing, we have made significant financial contribution to the social protective, to social protective initiatives. These includes, but are not limited to strengthen social safety nets to combat poverty and inequality such as housing, food assistance, and cash transfers. Mr. Speaker, again, let me repeat, this government has strengthened safety nets to combat poverty and inequality, and that includes strengthening our housing program, food assistance, and cash transfer, transfer programs. Mr. Speaker, permit me to share programs under the SS, SSDF that speak to a current ministry educational assistance. This program seeks to provide students from socioeconomically deprived and vulnerable households with support required to take advantage of opportunity to attain a sound education, academic or technical vocational. The government is aware that while education has been recommended as a panacea for poverty, poor households can't afford to cover the cost of some of the essential requirements that would better pos position their children to take advantage of educational opportunities. Mr. Speaker, just by way of example, there are times that we provide the school books, we provide food, we provide uniform, we pay tuition, but transportation cost is, prevents a child from accessing education. With this in mind, the government allocated unprecedented amount of $3.1 million towards educational assistance in 2023-2024 to provide educational assistance to socioeconomically -economic, deprived and vulnerable households. One of the approaches featured prospective beneficiaries applying for assistance through a support service unit and the others through various constituency offices. To have access to, sup to support through the support service uni unit, applicants must have participated in a proxy means test 3.0 and attain a qualifying score to receive assistance. A total of 1,146 households, which is approximately three, multiplied by 3.2, almost 3,500 students receive assistance 
from the Support Services Unit during 2023-2024. With approximately 70% of the households being beneficiaries of persons on public assistance. The health and other social implications is that of poor housing conditions as well as are well documented and are a reality for a significant number of poor solutions these people are living in deplorable conditions. And of course, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, anyone who has done an analysis or a poverty assessment or a survey of household living condition, one of the strong indicators of poverty is the condition of persons' homes. And if you visit them at their homes, you would see the number of persons who have a small basin, a little bucket here and there, catching water to prevent their homes from being flooded. The government of St. Lucia is committed to improving the living conditions of people experiencing poverty and the SSDF Housing Assistance Program is one of the initiatives that reflects government commitment to addressing the housing challenges on this island. Mr. Speaker, it is the first time, Mr. Speaker, that government did not just make allocation and leave it at the whims and fancies for, for parliamentarians or politicians to assist individuals. But there was a program, a social housing program led by the minister responsible for housing, housing on the, on, in St. Lucia where persons received assistance to, to improve their housing conditions. Mr. Speaker, the, the St. Lucia Social Development Fund received $1,395,000 in their housing assistance program last year and this will continue this year. The program beneficiaries came throughout the island. Approximately 65% of the beneficiaries being single mothers. The assistance offered through this program included rental, renovation, expansion support, utility, and the construction of new dwelling structures. Mr. Speaker, some people take lightly or do not understand what it means when you assist somebody's home. Mr. Speaker, there are times when you visit or when you hear the story of a, of a young lady has left home on the age and you visit the housing condition, you tend to put a relationship with, chil with, um, with children living homes and their housing conditions. When you improve, when the home condition is better, children are prepared to stay home. Of course, when the housing conditions are not good, and other young, other persons can whisper in their ears, I can take you somewhere else better. Children are tempted to leave home because of the housing conditions doesn't allow for children to stay home. When this government in, invests in improving households, we invest in actually allowing children to stay at home. And that includes their protection, that, in, that reduces their vulnerability. So housing assistance goes a long way in mitigating the effects of poverty on homes and all of the ills that's associated with, with vulnerability. HOPE Sponsorship Program. This program represents a multifaceted approach towards addressing the complex challenges of poverty and deprivation, incorporating diverse interventions. Among its key components are social safety net initiative designed to provide immediate relief to vulnerable individuals and households facing economic hardship. Additionally, Livelihood programs are implemented to empower beneficiaries, beneficiaries with skills and resources needed to generate sustainable income and improve their overall well-being. Complementing these efforts are community support initiatives to foster a sense of belonging and collective resilience among marginalized communities. Moreover, the program strongly emphasizes capacity building for community-based organizations and non-government organization to enhance the ability to deliver effective services and support to those in need. During the financial year 2023-2024, $1.3 million was expended on sponsorship. The sponsorship resources were used to assist clients in the areas of burial assistance, creative community engagement, small business initiatives, employment, medical, housing, social, domestic assistance, small infrastructure projects, and micro-enterprise support. Mr. Speaker, these areas of investment has impacted communities and individuals 
and of course when we speak of a of a reduction in our unemployment in our youth is as a is as a result of the number of initiatives that actually that actually is being brought together on in responding to vulnerabilities in our in our community on our island so of course yes hope contributed to unemployment and now we're seeing a reduction in the statistics as it relates to our unemployed youth. Constituency development program, social allocation. In a proactive move, the government of St. Lucia is committed to allocating a portion of the constituency development program to enact in, to allow interventions to bolster support for, most, for the most vulnerable, enhance community level capacity, and promote sustainable livelihoods initiatives. This allocation strategy ensures that funds are distributed constituency specific, allowing for targeted assistance tailored to each community unique needs. Residents seeking support for, for assistance through the CDP social allocation can now submit their application through, directly through designated constituency offices. This streamlined process facilitate access to vital resources and foster a sense of local ownership and engagement in addressing socioeconomic challenges across St. Lucia's diverse communities. Again, the thinking of the Prime Minister to allow CDP not just and only to see about small infrastructure, but allow the CDP program to support social interventions. Housing assistance allocation, again, to address the pressing need for housing assistance among its citizens, the government of St. Lucia has taken proactive steps by allocating housing resources to each constituency. This initiative relieves individuals and families needing small-scale housing support to ensure no one is left behind in essential, in essential shelters. Mr. Speaker. By decentralizing housing allocation process and distributing resources to constituencies across the country, the government seeks to address localized housing challenges effectively. This strategic approach allows for targeted assistance that caters to each community specific needs and priorities, fostering a more equitable and inclusive approach to housing provision. Under this housing allocation scheme, Constituents facing housing difficulties can now avail themselves of support through their constituency offices. By leveraging these local channels, the government aims to streamline the process of accessing housing assistance, ensuring that support reaches those who need it most in a timely and efficient manner. Furthermore, the Housing Allocation Initiative underscores the government's commitment to promoting social welfare and fostering community development across St. Lucia. By prioritizing housing relief, at the grassroots levels, the government aims to enhance the quality of life for its citizens while promoting stability and resilience within local communities. 138 individuals, 89 females, 49 males benefited from this initiative. And Mr. Speaker, just let me add, this year, the government's initiative of providing 20 million US dollars to the development bank to allow for persons to have 100% mortgage. I think this will only help improve and allow for persons who need the social housing program a lot better and then we will be able to target even more effectively. So persons who really need their mortgages, who can provide housing for a mortgage, would allow to take on this approach whereas the social low level housing assistance can be directed even more by persons who need it and i appreciate this mr speaker just one thing i we will the minute our ministry will continue to do is to continue to collaborate with the development bank because very often banks know individuals by the balance sheet bank would know you by what you can pay and what you cannot pay but our ministry know individuals by their vulnerabilities. We know them by how sick they are. We know them by the deprivation, what they're lacking. We know them through their struggles. And therefore, we would like a development bank that has a social conscience as it administers this loan for persons who need housing assistance. And do not go purely as a bank and just look at persons' balance sheet. Work with them, work with them closely to allow for persons to be successful in having a home. The Basic Need Trust Fund, Mr. Speaker. BNTF project seeks to reduce poverty and vulnerability through enhanced access to basic and 
economic infrastructure and human resource services consistent with our country poverty reduction strategy. The BNTF 10 program in its 10th cycle project focuses on four core areas. Education, human resource development, water and, sanita water and sanitation, and community access and drainage. Mr. Speaker, we have implemented a few projects and there are some that are ongoing. Rehabilitation of the Viewford Comprehensive School Food and Nutrition Lab. This is 20% complete and it's ongoing. The contractor has commenced work in November 2023 and this is expected to be completed by June 30th, 30, 2024. The after school music program in Chozel allocated at a cost of $243,000. The MOU was signed with the Chozel Music Committee on the 21st of July 2023 at the Reunion Primary School. The member for Chozel Fosse Jacques was present, I recall. Saltibus was present. Training component for executive members and Chozel Music Committee completed in November 2023. <laughs> Rehabilitation of pre-K classroom at Babono combined. A contract was signed in July 2023. Rehabilitation of pre-K classroom at the Bishop Gassi Primary School commenced in August 2023. Rehabilitation of pre-K classroom at Black Mengo will commence in August 2023. Entry for daycare center including supply of furniture equipment commenced on August 2026. Rehabilitation of a, of, of a, of a block in Sufre Primary School will commence in July 2023 and was completed in February 2024. Construction to commence on the Bele Early Childhood Center later this month. Yes. Let me repeat and correct myself. <laughs> Construction to, com to commence the Bele Early Childhood Center and the Labey Early Childhood Center will commence later this month. Uh -huh. Yeah, they waited so long for this. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, yesterday when the Prime Minister was announcing his honesty, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, it's strange on a small island how you could find yourself back from where you started. When we relocated people from Techime Bele, I was working at the Ministry of Planning and I had the opportunity to make promises under the Prime Ministership of Sir John at the time that we build Rosadam, relocate people from Techime Millet to create the new Bele area and we decided to start a preschool that was never completed. And I'm here as part rep of the same community today and to see that the community centre, the reinforcement, the steel exposing in the concrete blocks are still present today. And of course, while I worked at SSDF, we worked tirelessly. I was not successful in rehabilitating the Labby Early Childhood Centre and I'm happy that it's happening. Mr. Speaker, this is not through any difficult or heavy-handed net on my approach. It is the goodness of, Lord, of the Lord that allowed these things to happen. Human resource development under, under the uh, program of, of BNTF, Green Opportunity for Life Development, NSDC training in preparation for this project. This commenced in March 2024. This project is approximately $679,000. Adds business strengthening capacity, capacity for economic viability in the creative industry training in this area of marketing for creative financial management and productive development started in October 2023 with expected completion date in September 2024. At SCAPE, the consultant submitted the final design and estimate with stakeholders approval. Bids were submitted on February 8, 2024. Tenders Committee reviewed the bid evaluation report before a contract is awarded. The music studio phase three, the SSDF in collaboration with CDF, they have finalized a TOR and are procuring a consultant to install the music equipment in the studio. The TOR was issued to a prospective consultant who submitted an expression of interest on February 16, 2024. Basic community access drainage. Mr. Speaker, construction of a road and drain in Goodland West. Goodland West. The contractor commenced construction work on October 30th, 2023. Castry South, yes, in Goodlands West. Yes. <laughs> this includes the installation of a four inch main water main costing approximately 152,000 undertaken by Wasco. The, sub, 
the sub-project is to be completed later this month. Mr. Speaker, the construction of a road at Cronlands, Bexor. The work is 100% completed with additional work, driveway and box drain completed in December 2023. Sanitation and water, the installation of a water tank at Victoria Strozel. That sub-project is 100% complete. Wasco now has now has to complete the fencing for the tank area, which is their contribution to the sub-project. Mr. Speaker, let me move on to home care. The home care program has been embraced nationally as one of the most beneficial social interventions of the government of St. Lucia because of the comprehensive nature of the care provided to older adults and individuals with functional limitation and chronic health conditions in the comfort of their homes. The program features a person-centered integrated care approach with primary health care as its, as its central tenet. 863 clients who reside in communities throughout the length and breadth of St. Lucia benefit from the services offered through the team of 575 employees, which comprises of a program coordinator, an administrative secretary, zonal supervisors, constituency supervisors, assistant constituency supervisors, and caregivers. Mr. Speaker, again, I speak to 863 persons receive support and 575 persons employed to ensure that we provide care to senior adults. Mr. Speaker, on this point, I wish to again implore St. Lucians to take care of mommy and daddy in their old age if you can and not to just rely because we cannot provide care to everybody in St. Lucia. You cannot abandon your responsibility. Our culture of caring for our parents still must be encouraged and intact and be intact. So I am encur encouraging persons who can do better, they should do better. Mr. Speaker, I'm also encouraging faith-based organization on weekends if government is providing support during the week. I'm encouraging faith-based organizations, the church, support the government and provide support to them during weekends if, because you know they cannot come to church. Now persons are tempted to ask for additional support on weekends. That is costly to government and we will not be able to do so. And if there are situations where it is very critical, it is not something that can be sustained because of the cost. We are doing this over $10 million a year. It is costly, but this prime minister is happy to provide support to our senior persons. The decision was also taken 2023 to, util to utilize the prior learning assessment approach and classroom training to certify the caregivers. The program's management team has worked with St. Lucia's Techni Technical Vocational Council to assess 273 caregivers using a prior learning assessment approach. Could me certainly see. One of the initi initiatives conceptualized for graduating households from public assistance is the Kudme Setlisi program. Mr. Speaker, this program in terms of innovation started off in, the, in Chile, which is called the Bridge Program in Chile. It was to link persons who are vulnerable and poor to assets, to link them with opportunities to change their, their, their livelihoods. And that technology was transferred in three islands in the Caribbean, St. Lucia, Jamaica, and Trinidad, many years ago. And each island had renamed the program to suit their culture experience. So Kudme Setlisi is a Chilean model of social in intervention to respond to persons in extreme poverty. Mr. Speaker, we have used this program to help, and we have successful stories about the Kudme Setlisi program that's documented internationally. And of course, persons can go online and, 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 and see what you, I think it's UNDP have to say about the Kudme Setlisi program experience in St. Lucia. This program, Mr. Speaker, if it is implemented in its pure state, can help persons who are extremely poor graduate out of the extreme poverty not out of total poverty, but they're able to do things for themselves. The program is a timely paradigm shift away from the silo approach to poverty reduction by embracing multi-sectorial approach. It will focus on empowering families, escaping poverty and deprivation by facilitating access to income, 
employment, housing, health, education, family counseling, and network that fortify family assets. Mr. Speaker, the project team for the execution of this program cycle has been employed and is presently working on the beneficiary selection. Yes, Mr. Speaker, the program is important for the well-being, the well-being of anyone who is extremely poor with a view of helping them graduate out of extreme poverty, persons with disabilities. This new activity is pivotal to the scheme of caring. On June 11, 2020, St. Lucia ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability making a legal commitment to implement a treaty's provision at a national level to advance the rights of persons with disabilities here in St. Lucia. This action indicates that a country, as a country, we are interested in the welfare of persons with disabilities. Mr. Speaker, at my last budget presentation, I mentioned the need to focus on or give more attention to persons with disabilities in St. Lucia. I desire to know about the situation of persons with disabilities and their needs. Today, I am pleased to inform you that the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment engaged a consultant who is preparing a final report which will be submitted to the desk of a minister responsible for disability. And this re report will include a situational analysis and assessment of persons with disabilities in St. Lucia, an assessment report integrating the eight gender and diversity perspective. These are critical findings derived from the stakeholders' consultation a roadmap on a five-year action plan, on a five-year action plan on necessary legislative policy reform to protect and promote the rights of persons with disabilities. The minister responsible for disability, I said it's a five-year action plan. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I now share that activities that align with the productive society. Mr. Speaker, productive society is one where people live fulfilling lives, actively contribute to the progress and welfare of the community, in the, to the community. Individuals will enjoy a productive society when placed in positions of independence. Some of the identified areas include graduation of PAP, graduation, of, when I say PAP, I mean the Public Assistance Program, and Job Placement Initiative. Mr. Speaker, in these initiatives, rest assured that individuals are exposed to economic activities which allow them to provide for themselves. All persons, ultimately, would love to live a life where they are economically independent. Graduations, graduation of persons on public assistance, Mr. Speaker, is an imperative. We must graduate persons on public assistance. Mr. Speaker, the graduation of persons in public assistance is ongoing. This commences with, with training sessions conducted for officers and adopting what we call the PAP KSL or the Public Assistance Could Mess At Least Operations Manual Guild at Transparency and Objectivity. Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned during my last year's budget presentation, our waiting list of persons who are qualify for public assistance but cannot be placed on the program keeps growing. Mr. Speaker, to address the needs of our most vulnerable as, as a country, we must apply these interventions to social upliftment, empower and to facilitate economic inclusion of our most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to see that once again the Prime Minister of Finance have recognized the importance of people empowerment. The Prime Minister understands the need to facilitate empowerment and not enable dependence on social support. The Kudmes Sedlisi program and the graduation strategy featured in the 2024-25 budget presentation will support persons on public assistance. This graduation strategy represents a viable way for the government of St. Lucia to participate in a graduation programming. The strategy aims with a select public assistant program cash transfer grant beneficiaries to empower persons not to, not to enable any means of dependency posture, individuals will go through a scientific assessment using SLNet 3.0. Yes, Minister? So we cannot arbitrarily place persons on public assistance. And there are times that 
individuals, parliamentarians, believe or they would recognize someone they deem vulnerable and should be on public assistance. But it cannot be done arbitrarily. The person must go through the national proximates test. Let me break it down a little. Individuals from Welfare Group 1 with a score of 68 and below will be referred to as indigent poor. They will be eligible for welfare support and they will remain on the program. Individuals with a score between 68 to 69 referred to as poor will be on track for exiting the public assistance program. And those with score more than equal or more than 79 or who are considered non-poor will be placed in two clusters. Cluster one, these individuals will be offered short term, a short term based on their needs, while individuals in cluster two will be given notice to exit, to exit the program. Mr. Speaker, there are some people that cannot graduate from a school if you're not in the school. And then some persons who are on public assistance are not, cannot be on public assistance because they are not poor. Because public assistance are for poor persons. And if you are not poor, how do we graduate you? Yeah, so we have assessed almost 3,500 persons who are receiving public assistance and we have assessed almost 700 persons who are non-poor. They are not poor, they ought not to be receiving. And if you have over 600 persons who ought not to be receiving that they are not poor and then you have 1,500 persons who who are qualified to be on, but you have not space to put them on. You have a dilemma. So the growing list for persons who should be on the, on the, on, on, receiving a public assistance are growing, yet we have persons who are not poor, but receiving. And that is why we have said that if you're not, you cannot graduate, you need to be off the program to allow persons who are qualified to be on the program. Mr. Speaker, once again, we remain committed to this method. We can monitor the list of persons on public assistance while empowering those who have the capacity and capability to do so. Mr. Speaker, we continue to examine pillars under the Productive Society. The St. Lucia, the St. Lucia Social Development Fund, the HOPE Job Placement Program, is key in this regard. And I'm coming closely to an end. Um, Mr. Speaker, how much time do I have left? 19. Thank you so much. Through collaborative efforts spanning public and private sectors, the HOPE Job Placement Program was initiated to directly respond to the persistent challenge of high, un high unemployment rates in St. Lucia by providing tailored support and pathways to secure stable employment opportunities. The program aims to address not only job seekers, it, not job seekers, not, let me repeat, Pathways to secure stable employment opportunities. The program aims to address not only job seekers' immediate needs, but also the country's broader socioeconomic challenges. Through strategic partnerships forged with businesses, government agencies, and other stakeholders, the HOPE Initiative endeavors to broaden job accessibility, foster socioeconomic advancement across St. Lucia. 90 participants experience placement in sectors like hospitality, service skills training, security, culinary arts, and agriculture. By catering to beneficiaries' diverse needs and interests, the HOPE Job Placement Program plays a pivotal role in driving inclusive growth, enhancing workforce participation, and untimely, ultimately contributing to the overall prosperity and resilience of St. Lucia's economy. This overwhelmingly positive outcome underscores the program impact in empowering individuals and fostering long-term employment opportunities making a significant milestone in the journey towards socioeconomic advancement for participants and the wider community. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the final pillar of my presentation identify activities denote a ministry's promote, that promotes responsible, a responsible society. The Income Support Program. Mr. Speaker, not a noteworthy intervention in the safety nets of a vulnerable population affected by the coronavirus COVID-19, the project primary objective is to provide relief to vulnerable households, individuals affected by the prolonged impact of COVID-19 and support a minimum quality of life. Meeting the basic needs of vulnerable households is consistent with the national development policy of government. It is also in sync with the mandate 
of the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment. Approximately 70% of the components of this, project, of this project are completed. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that close to 3,000 persons who did not previously benefit from other income support initi initiatives have collected, have collected their one-time $1,500. Additionally, the project holds firm to the mission of the Ministry supporting equality and non-discrimination endeavoring to, endeavoring to ensure that no one is left behind while acknowledging social protection as a human right. After school program, Mr. Speaker, in an effort to tackle social, the, the social plague that hinder youth development and to create an environment that fosters positive youth development and growth, the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment recommissioned the Community After School Program in September 2023. Mr. Speaker, several factors are considered when selecting a child for participation in the program, including unsupervised during after school hours, members, member of an impoverished household, academic performance, and other child abuse. All these behavioral issues are considered when placing a child in the after school program. Mr. Speaker, when children are left unsupervised, they can be taken advantage of. Other individuals may want to groom them for participation in, in illegal activities. They have the time. We have 420 participants, and they will learn life skills, which will positive, positively impact their lives. Remember, yes. um, I notice you have a certain smooth energy this morning. <laughs> but, um, and I also noticed midway in your presentation that broad smile on your face. Yes. And I realized it could not be me. So I looked to my right and I understood. Yeah. You, have you have 15 minutes left. <laughs> thank you so much, Mrs. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you, Mr. Speaker, in recognizing the presence of my daughter and wife who are in the chambers there this morning. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, we are convinced that they will be well rounded, confident, and independent individuals who are best equipped to escape poverty, contribute to, a, to the upliftment of their families and make an impactful contribution to society. Mr. Speaker, the after school program is a program that is extremely close to my heart. When you visit families, households in need of housing assistance, in need of health assistance, but there's also a child 12 years old who's unable to go to school because there's no transportation to send a child to school and there are five children. And the 12-year-old is the eldest. Mr. Speaker, the after-school program is a program needed to tackle these households and provide relief in a way that other interventions does not allow. And when you, at first hand I could encounter such families, I promote the after-school program. And I'm happy that the Prime Minister is making almost a million dollars available for the after-school program. This will help children across the length and breadth of the culture instead of allowing them to fall through the crack. Mr. Speaker, some of the locations for centers of the after-school program this year was Denier Riviere, Moshi, Babono, Boapatat, Cicero, Hudson, Ancillary, Canaries, Soufre Town, Reunion, Chosel, Oje, Viewfort, Viewfort Town, Bellevue, Viewfort North, Blusha. Mr. Speaker, I notice that it's, I can repeat the communities where you can get after-school program shelters. Denier Riviere, Moshi, Babono, Boapatat, Where's Bois Patat? Bois Patat. Cicero. Hudson. Ancillary Canary, Soufre Town. Reunion. Chosel. Oje. Beaufort. Bellevue. Beaufort North. And Blanchard. Across the island. No one left behind. No one left behind. <laughs> you do not recognize the place. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we continue our discussion on children. We continue to offer psychosocial support and educational support to the children in foster care. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as we prepare for the observance of World Children's Day, November 2024, I beg my colleagues and the rest of St. Lucia to join me in solidarity against child maltre maltreatment and to recommit to zero tolerance for child abuse and, maltre and maltreatment and promoting a general welfare of our children. Mr. Speaker, we continue to carry the banner, the banner of a responsible ministry and by extension, a responsible government through critical activities under the James Belgrave Microenterprise Development Fund. This body seeks to reduce unemployment and promote the growth of microenterprise businesses. 
They, they offer affordable business loans to unemployed, self-employed, and underemployed. Loans are payable up to four years, a maximum of $33,000 is available. And the overall, overall, this entity endeavors to help improve the economic and social well-being of vulnerable persons holistically. Belfan intends to, to offer loans at 10.5% per annum. Mr. Speaker, we have made changes in what is required. Before you needed three guarantors, now you need only one. In collaboration with the St. Lucia Social Development Fund, Belfan offered 17 women loans on the Vulnerable Women's Program, and I'm pleased with this program because it is a successful program. The Human Cap Capital Resilience Project. Implementation of the Human Capital Resilience Project 2020 is ongoing, which aims to further strengthen our social protection system through increased coverage of national public assistance program, updating the policy and strategy document to mainstream, ad to mainstream adaptive social protection response. A national social protection policy and action plan 2020-2030 approved by cabinet May 2023. A strategy for graduation from social assistance program that was approved by cabinet in May 2023. The Ministry of Equity approved the operations manual for PAP KSL or public assistance could mess at least in November 2023 and the communication and advocacy strategy for social protection 2023-2025 was approved by the Ministry of, Equ of Equity in October 2023. Way forward. New and improved youth services establishment, a juvenile rehabilitation center. Mr. Speaker, our ministry has embraced the concept of collaboration and partnership. The realization of this partnership will enhance the creation of a supportive and nurturing environment. It is imperative, Mr. Speaker, that we create the ideal environment, not just as a means to create an inclusive and just, and, and just society, but one that will serve as a catalyst for young persons to realize their full potential that empowers our youth to realize their full potential alongside positive social change regardless of their past circumstances. Mr. Speaker, we continue to share the significant initiative to address our concerns about our youth in this August House. These young men and women require care protection and those in conflict with the law as well. This pressing societal concern is the re-engineering of our youth services or what we term in our budget the estimates for the establishment of a juvenile rehabilitation center. The establishment of this center underscores our commitment as a nation to adhere to the principles and international standards of juvenile justice, including the Convention on the Rights of a Child. Mr. Speaker, coupled with antisocial behavior and other societal concerns, services at the new facility will address the distinctive needs of, vulnerable, of vulnerabilities of our youth. We aim to promote positive behavior change among our youth by offering supportive, rehabilitative environment suitable for the development stage. With a new location at the former George Charles Secondary School, the new center is undoubtedly a beacon of hope and transformation. Mr. Speaker, I want all of St. Lucia to support the government in this initiative. Mr. Speaker, we also have the Offenders Reintegration Pilot Project. The SSDF has secured financial resources totaling $137,000, $392.23 through a funding partnership with Wiry Project. Mr. Speaker, this Offenders Reintegration Pilot Project aims to create an opportunity for several livelihood pathways for offenders and capacity building and physiological and psychosocial support for offenders to reintegrate into society successfully. Mr. Speaker, this project targets incarcerated youth between ages 18 to 29. The project aims to reduce crime and improve the criminal justice system by facilitating a reintegration of former in inmates into society. Participants will be provided with access to a package of support services which will include employment, entrepreneurship, livelihood pathways, as well as capacity building and human capital in initiative, such as career counseling, life skills, and remedial education, along with physiological and psychosocial support that seeks to trigger behavioral change. Specific emphasis will also be placed on reducing risk fa factors, which is evident at the family and community levels. Mr. Speaker, while we make such investment in our young men in particularly, I must, 
hard that young men must take responsibility for their lives. All of the effort make, made by successive governments and through all agencies, it is the young men who must make decision, ultimate decision to change their lives around and make use of this opportunity. So while we do so, I'm asking the young men under the hearing of my voice to take life seriously and make amends as we invest in them. The Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment recognizes the deficiency in support services for offenders. The pilot will provide 20 offenders with access to services and opportunities. These opportunities will also include protective factors, strengthening and safeguard, and to reduce the likelihood of reoffending and further incarceration or to interfere with the criminal justice system. Specific emphasis will also be placed on reducing risk fa factors which is evident at the family and community levels. The ultimate goal is to establish a practical system approach that will guide the government in successfully reintegrating offenders and can guide policymakers with the overall national social protection and transformation policy and program framework. Mr. Speaker, counseling. There will be a counseling unit on division at the Human Services and Family Affairs. With the increased social case that threatens the mental health and livelihoods of individuals, families, and communities, a counseling unit will be housed at the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, and Empowerment. Again, Mr. Speaker, this administration continues to advo advocate for the total health, including mental, social health. This unit will offer support across all agencies. Member, you have five minutes left. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While our ministry is responsible for social intervention and empowerment, I wish to highlight the support from philanthropists and other corporate citizens. We express our profound gratitude to the government and people of Taiwan, our friends from Martinique, and other private citizens who reside abroad. Our contribution, uh, their contribution augment our existing services, and we say thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, the, there is a constituency stimulus program education. This program can be accessed by applying for educational assistance at the offices of the parliamentary representatives when it is announced. This program is mainly administered through the office of the parliamentary representative. And last year, or this financial, the finan past financial year, we assisted 4,411 households. They benefited from this program. A, big, a breakthrough of the assistance can be will be made available subsequently. But, Mr. Speaker, there is something that of special, uh, of special mention. I'm talking about a new and the first bus shelter in the community of Sarat. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this, this, initiative, this initiative represents the thinking of not just the member for the con of this constituency, but the collective aspirations and desire of every member of this parliament. Mr. Speaker, we are allowed to be innovative. We are allowed to think and to do things differently. This bus shelter speaks to what this government will do, and there'll be, a, there'll be examples of it in different forms. When you see what's happening on, 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 on in the city of Castries, when you, when you look at what has happened, what will be happening to Trinity, the place is being transformed, and it allows us to dream, it allows us to think outside of the box. So this Sarat community bus shelter, and I call it a bus stop, Mr. Speaker, very soon, ancillary countries, we are identifying a site to put one. We're going on to Buto, other Buto, um, 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 Junction. We will be on the Viewfort Main Road. Of course, we are looking to provide washrooms in critical areas. And Mr. Speaker, I'll challenge my, my, I'm the member for Central Castries, right there by Bannon, where all the people are waiting for the buses. We need to put washrooms there as well. There are pregnant persons who need washrooms. There are, we have this situation with, with diabetes. People continue to hold the blood and get even worse. And the comfort station, and this one is so unique, Mr. Speaker, and less than 4,000 square foot, less than 4,000 square foot, we have two attendants working on shift system and three persons operating a hairdressing salon. Livelihoods for five persons on just 400 square foot of land is an amazing transformation of a community. Conclusion, Mr. Speaker. Through constra though constraints and challenges are great, we continue to do our utmost to deliver support. The challenges of human financial constraints threaten our efforts, but we are not discouraged, Mr. Speaker. To my constituents, 
I thank you for your support and your commitment. I am thankful for the opportunity you afforded me to represent you and persons deemed vulnerable in St. Lucia. I am perpetually grateful. To my staff, the Permanent Secretary, the Deputy Permanent Secretary, my attache and the staff of equity, my staff at the constituency office, I say thank you and your willingness to join forces to empower and educate. I say thank you to the members of the Castries Southeast Constituency Council for working so well with me so today we can achieve what we have achieved and we continue to work harder for the people of Castries Southeast. For you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honorable Prime Minister for his thoughtfulness and purposeful action, always looking out for the most vulnerable and keeping true to the mandate of putting people first. Honorable Prime Minister, sir, I say thank you. The Ministry of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment pledged its support to examine every effort which will promote caring, responsibility and productivity. With your concerns about achieving a positive social change, we can rest assured of your continuous commitment and continuous service to vulnerable persons, strengthening the social protection system and meeting the SDGs, especially 1.3, which addresses poverty reduction. Finally, I invite all of us to take note of the real measure of our resources. Our authentic success should not be determined through dollars and cents or budget line items, but rather by positive impact of social change that we can make as individuals to our families, to ourselves, to our community, leaving no one behind. As such, I invite you to join the Philip JP administration to carry this mandate of positive social change with pride, dedication, and an unwavering dedication to fairness and justice for all St. Lucians. Mr. Speaker, we can do all of this, all of this by supporting our Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, finally, I just need to say this one, that We've not missed not one day in cabinet. Every week for, since we have, you have placed us there, we have been in cabinet. And when a holiday falls, then we go on to the next day. We have represented and worked hard. Our cabinet hours have been long. And the gains that we have made is not through any miracle, but we think, I believe, we are spiritually led. So, Mr. Speaker, when I listen to the words of the Prime Minister, when I am troubled, when I'm asking for more, and he says to me, Mr. Minister, take it easy. Don't get sick, Mr. Minister. Take it easy. Take it easy. It's one day of, at a, one day, a time. One day, of a time. one day, at a time. Yes. So, Mr. Speaker, with these words, I want to leave the words of this song, one day at a time, which says that I am only human. I'm just a man, just a woman. Help me believe in what I could be and all that I am. Show me the stairway that I have to climb. Lord, for my sake, teach me to take one day at a time. One day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I am asking from you. Just give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Yesterday's gone. Certainly, we cannot bring it back. With these words, I take my seat as we continue to move and do this work for wonderful people of St. Lucia, one day at a time. Thank you very much.